to get some grip tape, gotta get my stick made, maybe get some pads, play goal, make a sick save, no pads, then I'll mix them out of thick cape, yeah, it was kinda ghetto, but we were just kids, eh, if your childhood was like mine was. This video is looking into depth and how to properly apply it, some limiting factors on how you use depth, and when to challenge the shooter and when to be conservative. In most cases, depth and angle are applied in a signal movement, but this video will only cover depth, so some of the movements shown may not be what you expect. This video is focusing strictly on the depth part of the game. That being said, if you want to apply depth correctly, you must first master angle. If you have not done so, feel free to look at my previous videos covering this topic, as it is a fundamental building block for this video. Depth is quite often referred to as challenging the shooter or making yourself big. But as you will see here, there are times to challenge, and times to just maintain or shrink your depth. First you must have angle on the shot, then you can gain depth, as angle will determine how effective your depth will be. How close we are to the puck determines how much of the net there is to shoot at. Closer to the puck, the less net the puck should see, within reason, meaning you look bigger. Farther back in your net means the puck should see more net or the smaller you look. I know you think I should be saying what the shooter sees, but I don't care what they see, as all that really matters is the puck's point of view. That is also why I always say line up to the puck and not the shooter. I'll give a few examples in this video. It is easy to challenge a shooter when there is no pass option, but harder to do so as more play options are available to the puck holder. A few different plays can limit how much we can challenge in different ways, i.e. screen plays, backdoor plays, high slots, breakaways, and say a one on three. We have a few rules of thumbs for the guidelines for visual cues on where we should be for most part on our depth to make the most of our body frame. These cues or landmarks are the ringette line, hash marks, top of the crease, and the ringette crease. The new visual cues we're going to use this time is also the middle of our crease or the save decision zone. We can gain depth with a few different types of footwork but the most common ones are c-cuts and t-pushes. I have videos covering these basic movements if you're unfamiliar with them. Each movement has an appropriate time and place but as a general rule of thumb you want to avoid a double-footed c-cut to gain space as it is really hard to make any other movement until you complete this movement. A shuffle is also used, but nowhere near as often, so I don't think I need to give a demonstration of this yet. Gap control is another big part of depth, but in the interest of keeping these videos short enough that you don't get bored, or you have to search content within a video, I'll save gap control for the next video. Why is angle important? Angle must be correct before we worry about depth, and here is why. If we feel we are in correct angle, but are not, as given in these two examples I will show, in one the goalie is square to the puck but has incorrect angle, in the other the goalie has correct angle in their starting position but their body is not square to the puck, it will affect the outcome. As always, the shot cone will be in grey, skates in blue, and goalie stick and shoulders in red. With the shot in the position it is and the depth being getting closer to the puck in most cases, we will move each goalie here towards the puck. As the goalie, without correct starting angle moves outwards, they leave net for the shooter to shoot at until they reach their destination, where angle and depth cross. The other goalie with a good starting position but lack of frame of body feels like they are gaining depth on the shot, but as they move outwards, they lose angle and give up more net. This is why all aspects of angle are important. Shot line, position of frame of body, and being square to the puck. Now that you have angle, we can worry about point of view of the puck and the depth. As you can see here, the puck has a limited angle to the net or crossbar and posts. So you can call this a shot box or cone, I guess. And the depth is based on filling as much of this shot box with as much of our body as possible. Most think that they will just move towards the puck and the closer you are, the less space there is to score, which is true for the most part. But we want to be efficient with our movements and not give up, say, the option of a pass. So the balance comes in filling as much of the shot box as possible while not getting too much of the frame of body outside the shot box. A little is good though. 
this should make the shooter think they have a chance to score if they also have a pass option. Hopefully they will make the poor decision of shooting when there is very little net shown to the puck. If we over challenge the shooter they will clearly see they have no chance of scoring and will most likely pass. But because we are challenging so much and since the goalie is so far out to cut down on the shot they will have a much farther to move in order to obtain proper angle or position on the new shooter. Thus they will most likely get beat by the next shot or tip. So now you see how we can try to balance depth in most cases. But I should give you a few guidelines visually to help you with your depth control first. The visual cues we're going to use for depth are the top of the crease, the ringette crease, the hash marks, and the ringette line, and the save decision zone. The save decision zone is the halfway point between the top of the crease and the goal line, or basically the middle of the crease area. I will touch on this zone more in depth in the next video on gap control. For now, let's start with the hash marks and how they help mark out the front door area of our plane area. See Landmark's video for this. If we assume the goalie has proper angle on any shot in the zone, yet they find themselves outside this box, I would say you are over challenging the shot. To wander outside of this area shown here usually leads to a goal against us because our goalies seem to run around a bit if they're outside of here. But as with every rule of thumb, there are exceptions. The next two cues on our depth is the ringette line shown here and the ringette crease shown in red. These two have a direct relation to each other for depth. If, they are, if there is only one shot to be taken or the shooter is committed to shoot beyond the ringette line, your depth should be somewhere between the ringette crease and the top of the crease. This ensures you are challenging a shot as much as possible, thus making yourself as big as possible. The top of the crease is related to the hash marks in most cases for the depth. If the shooter is between the hash marks and the ringette line, we want our depth to have our feet somewhere on the crease edge. If the shooter crosses the ringette line, then the goalie's heels or the middle of the foot should be on the top of the crease. Once the shooter has made it into the hash marks, the goalie should have their toes on the inside of the top of the crease. When the shooter makes it to the top of the crease, the goalie should be challenging, but if they are pushed back the sh to the shallowest depth the goalie should maintain, it is in the middle of the crease at this point. This is commonly called the save decision zone. Okay, now you've seen the relation of how far the shot can be away from the net and where the goalie should commonly be in regards to depth provided the goalie has correct angle and frame of body. Okay, now let's look at the typical plays we face and how they will affect our depth management. For this first example, we'll look at a one-on-one -on -one play and how to handle it. So you can see the differences as we look at also a two-on-one and two-on-os. If I have a one-on-one -on -one with a defenseman who is playing it proper, then we can commit to the shot and not have to worry about being deeped as the defenseman will limit them. This allows us to be out as far as we can for the most part because our D-man should be pushing the shooter to the outside. As long as we maintain proper angle on the shot, we almost don't have to change our depth until the shooter gets really low in the zone, almost to the bottom of the face-off circle. Okay, now let's look at a 2 on 0 situation, with the shooter being the closest to the net and the pass option farther away. Since the passing option is farther away, our depth is set by the shooter. If they are on the side and just inside, say, the face-off circle, our ideal depth is somewhere on the top of our crease. Since the pass option is beyond the ringette line, in this case, we can maintain this depth because when that pass is made, we have time and space to move correctly to get to proper position. Now let's reverse the puck's starting position. The shooter is at the ringette line and the passing option is now closing for a back door from the face-off dot. Our depth is controlled by the closest potential threat in most cases. So now instead of having ideal depth on the top of our crease for the shot from just beyond the ringette line, we have to retreat a bit so we have proper depth for the potential backdoor play. Basically the goalie's depth is limited by the closest scoring chance. So as you can see here, if they have to make a pa this pass, I must be able to get to this spot to give myself the highest chance of making the save. In order to do this, the goalie should back into their net a little so they have less distance to cover as the pass is made. And in order to avoid chasing space, 
we will make our movement back into the net more and lose some depth in order to gain proper angle on the shot quicker. If the passing option is really close to the goalie, they no longer have to move back and give up space in order to have a high chance of making this save, as they can maintain depth and quickly arrive in the correct angle for the next shot or tip. This means our depth to the shot is controlled by the depth of the closest potential shot or passing option. The closer we are to this potential pass option, the more we can maintain correct depth for the actual depth of where the puck is and not where it will be. Now if we add a defenseman into the equation, our goalie's depth becomes more complex. It can mainly depend on what the defenseman chooses to do. There are some other factors, but let's keep it simple for now as we are just addressing our depth and how to apply it in this video. So we have a two on one with a shot here and a passing option over here, a little closer to the net. Without the defenseman, my depth should be here to protect against a potential passing option. Now if my defenseman plays this situation wrong and tries to challenge a shooter more than the pass, the goalie must maintain this depth because there's a chance of the pass getting through. If my D-man plays the pass more correctly, then the goalie can challenge a little more in hopes the D-man will pick off the pass or deter the shooter from attempting such a play. Say reducing the chances of getting the pass through to like 50%. You'd think that this is the ideal play for the defenseman to make as they are taking the pass. But from a competent goalie standpoint, I want the defense to take the pass option out of the picture. This will in essence reduce the two on one play into two separate one on one battles. Now as a goalie, I'd have less options to think about and can commit to the shot 100%. Let me explain the mental advantage behind this theory. If we think about our attention like a computer's RAM, it makes sense as to why this is more ideal. If a computer has two apps open, it could potentially commit 50% of its RAM to each app and run each app at an optimal speed of say 60%. But if you hand the app or the passing option off to another computer, our defenseman, we now have 100% of the RAM that can run the first app, which is the shooter, at 100% of the speed, so we will operate better. So if my D-man takes the passing option 100%, then the goalie has less to worry about and can focus on the shot 100%. They can also challenge a bit more because the potential pass has a very low success. These choices have more to it than that and can be very complex at higher skill levels. But for now, the player takes away the pass, so it forces the shooter to be able to shoot or deke or delay. That's it. If the shooter elects to shoot or deke, the goalie is now 100% focused on him and has a high chance of success. If the shooter chooses to delay and wait for the rest of their team to gain the zone, hopefully our goalie's team does it too. And now it makes it an even 5-on-5 five -five battle, which in our goalie opinion is easier than the 2-on-1 battle if our D-man had not played this correctly. Now let's look at how to gain some depth in some plays. If a puck moves from a low point in the corner to the point, a goalie is commonly going to move with a T push to cover the long distance. As you can see here in this example, the goalie will push to a destination that will gain them angle first and foremost, while maintaining and gaining a little depth. Now let's assume the point shot is 100% going to come, and there are no other options but the shooter bobbles the pass just for a second. This now gives us a chance to gain more depth and challenge the shot more. Ideally here the goalie will C cut with the inside foot to gain another six inches or so. A one footed C cut is best as they will arrive balanced and during the movement they can still have an option of another move or save. If the goalie elects to use a two footed C cut, they're committed to finishing the C cuts before they're are any movement options available other than a rather sloppy butterfly. We want to avoid this because movements with options are best, for obvious reasons. So let's look at a C cut to gain depth and rotate in say a play that transitions from below the goal line to above it. While the puck is below the goal line we want the goalie to remain low, say in a 45 degree angle in their net, to reduce the chance of being shot on from a crazy angle. 
and it gives them the best chance of stopping a play in the slot as they can rotate quickly. But as the puck moves above the goal line, the goalie should face the puck and get off the post and able to be able to make a save, probably a butterfly save. If the goalie does not move away from the post in this process of facing the shot, the goalie is often scored on short side, as they end up pushing off of the post while going down or leaving space there. So how do we reduce that, you ask? Well, as the puck moves above the goal line, our goalie should execute a C-cut with their inner foot to bring them square to the shooter and just beyond the post. Now if they have proper angle and a butterfly save is required, when the goalie goes down, their own foot and the post will not push them off angle. And in turn, they not only don't give up the short side, but they also aid in tracking the shot by not changing their own visual angles. One can also use a C-cut to reduce depth in a straight line or to get to the post if needed. But this is more related to gap control, which will be covered in the next video. Okay, in summary, we have shown you depth and how it can affect the puck's point of view for scoring. Landmarks and the relation to depth as both visual cues and deciding how we can challenge a shot. From the ring outline to the crease to the hash marks, all of these visual cues we may use. Then I gave a few simple examples of a different plays and how we might handle the situations. The effect of possible plays on the depth of the goalie and how much he can maintain it during such plays and why. I also touched briefly on how to move for the best position if the puck is passed into a clean shooting area or passed to a player who may have to work a bit for being able to get off a shot. If you have any questions or comments about this video, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'll answer them as soon as I can, or maybe even make a video to answer your questions. As always, I hope you find this video and others helpful and informative. Feel free to give a like, a share, or a subscribe to Coach Johnny for your hints, tips, tricks, and instructional videos on goaltending for hockey. Have fun out there on the ice, and as Red Green always said, keep your stick on the ice. When that song comes on, you still get that buzz And you know what to do, it doesn't matter where you was Get the beer, get the chips, and just turn it on up So get the beer, bring the chips, over here, bring the dip I hear the Hockey Night song playing Score goals, big hits, let's go 